Well, very good. Welcome, everyone. It's the top of the hour, so we'll get started. I'm Dio Agus back in Houston. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying in the U.S. we're celebrating Mother's Day, so a very happy Mother's Day to everyone that's joining us and to our speaker for taking the time today to speak with us. So we're very excited to have Dr. Nusha Java join us. So today she's going to speak with us on C3 glomerulopathy in the native kidney and post-transplant. We're very happy to have her with us today. Thank you. I will stop. Thanks a lot. Let me go ahead and share my screen again. Can you guys see it okay? Okay, perfect. Well, thanks, Dia. It's it's a pleasure being here. It's always very rewarding to be a part of GlomCon. And so when Dia asked me to talk about C3G, <laughs> there was no thinking twice. So, uh, and you know, I know that in the GlomCon series, there have been quite a few different talks on the topic and um, a lot of them pertaining to pathology per se. So really what I want to focus on today is going over the etiology, the pathophysiology, giving you all an overview of the understanding of the complement system in general and its role in particularly in C3G. <clears throat> I'll talk about the genetics, um, what we order, how we interpret those. I brought in two case-based examples, just kind of giving you a sneak peek into how some of these patients present and what their genetics looks like, and then kind of talking about some treatment options and what's kind of in the pipeline. So these are my disclosures. <clears throat> Excuse me. So C3 glomerulopathy, as you all know, is a, C is a glomerulonephritis, right? It's characterized by the deposition of the C3 component of the complement within the glomerulus in the absence or the near absence of immunoglobulin deposits. And we'll talk about in detail on how and why this makes sense. In terms of the incidence of C3G, it is estimated to be about one to three cases per million, and the prevalence is about five cases per million. Now, even though I say that, I will say this, that the incidence and the prevalence is really guided by the regional biopsy practices, the referral practices. So I take these numbers with a little bit of grain of salt. But overall, C3G is a rare disease. It's a prototypical complement-mediated disease. And I'm sure many of you also know that C3G really came out of MPGN, which is was the old classification. And so... Years ago, we used to classify these diseases as if you saw the membranoproliferative pattern on light microscopy, then that was divided into type 1, type 2, or type 3 based on where the deposit was. So type 1 was subendothelial, type 2 was intramembranous, and type 3 was subendothelial or subepithelial deposit. So C3G really came out of this old classification. And what we know now is that if there is an MPGN or similar pattern on light microscopy, then it's really the immunofluorescence which is really critical to figure out if you're looking at a C3G or an alternative pathway defect or are you looking at more of a classical lectin pathway defect. So if on immunofluorescence you see immunoglobulins which are as bright as C3G, as C3, then you are you know, going the route of the classical pathway activation and then you know a number of their infections, immune complexes, number of those diseases that we're all familiar with, you know, lupus being one of the classic ones. Versus if you see C3 positive, the immunoglobulins are either completely negative or they're really barely positive such that C3 becomes the predominant, um, you know, uh, uh, stain. Then you know that you're dealing with an alternative pathway defect. And that's where C3G comes in. And once that C3G is diagnosed on immunofluorescence, then the next step is doing an electron microscopy to then differentiate where are the deposits. If there are intramembranous deposits, then it's called dense deposit disease. And if there are more light, amorphous, mesangial, subendothelial, subepithelial deposits, then it's called C3GN. So C3G is a term that then is has two subtypes, dense deposit disease and C3GN. So when you talk about C3G, or you, you're maybe referring to either one of them. It's, it's only when you have an EM and you have a more clear-cut understanding, that's when you call it C3GN. So C3G and C3GN are not exactly interchangeable terms. So depending on what, how much you know in terms of the uh, <clears throat> biopsy, that's when you would define that disease. Now, the question is, what was the need to separate out C3G and, you know, have a whole separate disease by itself? So there was a lot of things that kind of went into this. First of all, as we recognized that the glomerular pathology, the clinical cores of these patients who had isolated or predominant C3 accumulation they were different from some of these others where, they, where they had immune complexes and C3 and that this, these patients had a much more heterogeneous presentation. Number two, um, you know, as we've understood 
the pathophysiology as the understanding of the complement system has really taken off in the last several years. We've recognized that really this set of diseases is because of a complement dysregulation and a specific component of that complement pathway, the alternative pathway. And I think the most exciting thing that's happened, of course, is the approval of many drugs. So, you know, in 2011 came the first anti-complement therapy, anti-C5, the eculizumab that came on. And then since then, there have been a number of drugs that have been in development. And really now we know that we have a, we have a drug and we have to...